Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. This is going to be the first of a two-part special, I guess you could call it, on the Battle of Waterloo and its influence on Napoleonic Wargaming. I'm going to do two parts. There's going to be this one. This is going to be the positives that the Battle of Waterloo has for Napoleonic Wargaming. And I'm also going to do a video which is the negatives that the Battle of Waterloo has. Now I should say here, I'm talking about the Battle of Waterloo. I'm actually referring to the entire 100 Days campaign. Now, regular viewers of the channel will know that recently we had a large-scale game of Catrabra, which is one of the battles that took place in the 100 Days. You've also got Linny, of course, and Vavre, as well as Waterloo, and uh, Gemin Corps, I think there's a battle there, and a couple of other ones as well. But um, when I use the term Waterloo, I'm talking either about the specific battle, but I may also be using it as a catch-all term for the 100 Days campaign. It's a little bit lazy, so apologies for that out uh, out front but I'm, I'm doing this more as a sort of stream of consciousness video i've not scripted this one so if i talk about waterloo in general terms then i'm talking about the entire 100 days campaign so i'm going to look at reasons why i think people like the 100 days campaign and why it's such a huge part of the napoleonic wargaming scene for what is you know effectively it's 100 days out of a 15 or 18 or maybe even 30 year period why is it so important and why is it played so often well the first reason i think is because it's an iconic matchup you've got the british in their red coats and you've got the french in their blue coats now i know it sounds silly but that's that right right there you've got a visually striking image you've got two sides of different uniforms facing off against each other now yes i know the dutch belgians are there and the nassau and all that stuff but looking at it from someone who doesn't know, maybe doesn't know that much about historical wargaming or maybe even wargaming whatsoever it's very easy to see what's going on you've got red guys you've got blue guys and they're against each other and not only do you have recognizable armies you've also got recognizable commanders now the general public, certainly in Britain, may not really know that much about the Duke of Wellington, but they may have heard of him. They, they've probably heard of someone who was known as the Iron Duke. Napoleon, of course, I think pretty much everyone's heard of. So if you, uh, you know, if someone wandered in off the street and said, what's this going on? And you said, oh, this is the Battle of Waterloo. It's Napoleon versus the British, the Duke of Wellington. Then they'd probably be able to know what you're talking about straight away. And that moves on nicely to the second point, which is brand recognition. Now, this is a bit of a marketing term, but brand recognition is really, really important. If you can turn up to an event or anything like that, or you're planning an event or something like that, and you say it's the Battle of Waterloo, instantly everyone knows that that's a thing. They've heard of the Battle of Waterloo. They may even have uh, say to you, oh yeah, is that where Napoleon did surrender from the old uh, ABBA song? Doesn't matter, it's all about that brand recognition. Now, here in the UK, We've got quite a bit named after Waterloo. We've got Waterloo Station, which used to be the uh, the terminus for the Eurostar, which is the super lol. But uh, they, they moved it to St Pancras, which is a bit bit, bit more boring in my opinion. But uh, we've got Waterloo Station. We've got Waterloo Roads going all over the place. And we, we've got various references to the Battle of Waterloo, particularly in London, but all over the country. There was even a popular school drama. It's all like, uh, yeah, I mean, it wasn't for kids, but it was set in a school. And that was called Waterloo Road, because that's where the, the school was. So I think there's a lot of brand recognition for Waterloo there. I think if you're talking to his, maybe people who aren't that into the period, they've probably heard of Waterloo. They might have heard of Trafalgar. That's probably about it. If you want to start talking to them about the vagaries of the Battle of Friedland, they're probably just going to give you a blank stare. But Waterloo, they'll have heard of. As an aside, actually, the... No, the knowledge of the Battle of Hastings here in the UK is super wide. Like, I reckon if you stop most British people and say, what happened in 1066? I reckon a lot of them, maybe not most of them, but a lot of them would be able to tell you, oh, there was a big battle, or it was like William the First came, or, something, or the Battle of Hastings, something like that. It's completely irrelevant, just, just a bit. Something that always surprises me. I always find it quite funny. But uh, yeah, so the second part is it's that brand recognition, and that's something that can be really useful to build on. If you are like, into marketing or business in any way, the brand recognition is really, really useful. And again, even if you know about the Napoleonic Wars, you can you know you can go along to say a display game and say what's this and someone says oh it's the battle of uh, we can't do the whole battle of waterloo so we're doing the battle around la haye saint 
and instantly in your mind you're oriented you know exactly what's going on you know oh the french are attacking the british are defending there's a built-up area you know, the rifles are in the sand pit all that good stuff you you've obviously got more knowledge than most people but it's one of those subjects where it's got such a depth of knowledge and that leads me on to two points one that i briefly touched on there in a second one the uh i'll come back to the one that i briefly mentioned the main one that i want to make is so this is the third main point is that i i cannot think of a battle that is more intensively studied than the battle of waterloo there's been uh, t thousands if not tens of thousands of books written about the battle of water i'm looking around uh, my recording studio now i can see a book called waterloo it's a hardback one i've got another one that's covered by my north vietnamese flag <laughs> don't, don't ask uh, i've got the full volume series in a nice slip case actually from osprey publishing i've got two copies of mark adkins waterloo companion and i've got 1815 the waterloo campaign and the german victory so these are just ones that i'm looking around that's directly in front of me now. I hate to think how many I've got downstairs or in other places. There's, I mean, there's books like The Battle. There's another uh, another one. I can just, I just noticed that I've got my copy of The Battle up there, but that's uh, about Asper Nestling. Uh, there's, there's a gazillion different ones. And also, it's made its way into, again, more mainstream sources. So you've got The Battle of Waterloo referred to in Les Miserables, of course, and it's in, I think, is it, is it Pride and Prejudice, where Sergeant Troy gets killed at Waterloo? I think it's Pride and Prejudice, it might not be, I'm not not an expert on that sort of Austin-type literature. <laughs> and there's also my current obsession, which is Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, which is absolutely awesome. If you've not seen it, it's currently on Amazon, and yeah, it's great. The woman who wrote the books just won an award for a second novel as well, actually. But anyway, uh, that's the, the, the one specific battle that's in there is the Battle of Waterloo as well. So it has it has broken into the mainstream, I guess you could uh, you could call it. And that's one of the things with the Battle of Waterloo. As I say, it's that it's so intensively talked about in so many different books and different medias that I think more people will have seen about the Battle of Waterloo than will know they have. So for example, at the beginning of the TV series, the BBC TV series of Les Miserables, started off and they had the cavalry going into the sunken road which was like a 18 foot ditch in the tv show which to be fair that's how it's written in les miserables so that's not a mistake from the tv crew there but you know these people will have will know about waterloo so it's got that brand recognition and that that can be a double-edged sword we'll talk about that in the why waterloo is the worst thing to happen to biotic wargaming i should say as well of course that sharp it's the only episode or book of Sharp that's named after the battle that it takes part in, apart from Sharp's Trafalgar. It's the only land battle that Sharp takes part in that's named after the battle. So you've got, like, Sharp's uh, Sword is the Battle of Fuentes Donoro. Well, you know, it's not called Sharp's Fuentes Donoro, is it? It's called Sharp's Sword. So, it's it, again, it's got that brand recognition. People who, my age, who grew up watching Sharp or whatever, they'll have heard of Waterloo from that as well. And lest we forget, there's the great 1970s film by Sergei Bondarchuk, Waterloo, which is the entire reason why, in my head, Napoleon spoke with a really thick New York accent. He always has, and he always will, as far as I'm concerned. Rod Steiger <laughs> is Napoleon Bonaparte. I should also say, as well, there are a lot of memoirs to come out for the Battle of Waterloo. So that's another source that we can look at as historians or wargamers and get that real boots-on-the-ground, eyes-on-the-field perspective of the battle. And that really it, it helps emotionally involve us in that game, which means that when we've got to paint our 800th French line infantryman, we're already invested in that project and in that battle. And feeding into the market recognition are the expectations of the armies. So the expectation of the French is that they are the dudes doing the attacking, and the expectation of the British is that they face sitting on their ass. There you go, there's a bit, <laughs> there's a bit of New York folium for you. Uh, and they are the defenders. And Waterloo obviously has that as well. You've got battles where the French defended, particularly in 1813 and 1814. You've got battles where the British attacked. Uh, the Battle of Salamanca being one example, the Battle of Vittoria being another one. So there were the battles where those roles were reversed, if you want to want to term it that way. Waterloo's not one of those. Waterloo, the British do what you expect the British to do. The French do what you expect them to do as well. The armies perform on brand, one could say. So the fifth reason why I think the 100 Days are so good is you've got a quite a wide variety of forces 
4-1 army. Now, this is going to come back in the why Waterloo is a negative thing uh, in the future. But for now, the Anglo-Allied army, which is what we should call it really, not the British army, the Anglo-Allied army, has a huge variety of units in there. You've got British, you've got Highlanders in their kilts, obviously. You've got KGL, the King's German Legion. They're just the guys in the red coats. You've also got the Dutch-Belgian troops. You've got Dutch-Belgian line, and you've got Dutch-Belgian militia. You've got the Nassau, you've got the Brunswickers, you've got uh, the Duke of Cumberland's Hussars before they all run away. So you've got a really wide variety of units, and that's just in the Anglo-Dutch army. You've also got the Prussian army as well. And lest we forget, the Prussians are really popular. I, I'm always, again, I'm always surprised by how popular the Prussians are. But you've got Landveer Lancers, which are quite cool. You've got the infantry, you've got Landveer infantry, reserve infantry. You've got different kinds of artillery. You, I, I should have said as well in the um, the talk about the commanders. You've also got Old Man Blucher as well. So you've got you know that guy who's at the the very end of his career, uh, going for one last roll of the dice. But you've got a, a wide variety of forces. Speaking of the forces, the French may not necessarily have that wider variety, but what they have got is they've got the cool stuff. It's a bit like when you war game World War Two. And you're the Germans, and you and you want to do 1945. You're not going to win. You're outnumbered. You're outgunned. You've got you know really poorly trained troops, but you've got all the best kit, and it looks good because you've got those King Tigers on the table. It's very similar to the Army of Water. You've got Carazias. You've got Carabineers. You've got most importantly of all the Imperial Guard. So despite it being a fairly homogeneous army, you've got a variety of units for the French. But more importantly, you've got more for the Allies as well. Now, one of the things I tend to find is that the Waterloo tends to be the suggestion of the British players or the Allied players more than it is the French players. Now, that could be because they won, obviously, but it or it gives them a wider variety of units that they can collect. We spoke earlier on about how the Battle of Waterloo, you may not be able to put on the whole thing, but you can just put on the attack of Hugomont or La Haison or the Place de Noir, something like that. And that's a, the, another really useful thing, is that you can divide the battle up into smaller sections. If you've seen my videos on how to put on a Napoleonic game, you'll see now I talk about how we played Vagram. Now, we didn't play the entire battle of Vagram. We played just the central part where Van Damme and uh, General Lamarck, speaking of uh, Le Miserable, and uh, I think it was um, Gerard, maybe? Uh, the three generals there attacked the centre of the Austrian line. So we isolated that part of the battle and we fought that you can do the same with waterloo very easily you can do the attack of the imperial guard that's a scenario in the albion triumphant volume two you can do uh, the attack on Ugamar, which is another scenario in the book you can do le Haysan. you can do um place noir you can do the prussian attack on there you can even do the the bits in between there as well you can do the initial cavalry charge when the British form square, there's you know, what would have happened if Ney had sent the infantry in as well, that kind of thing. So there's plenty of opportunity for breaking the battle into smaller parts there, which really lends itself to the next reason why the 100 days is so good. It's full, I mean, it's absolutely full of what-ifs. Now, this is also a bit of a result of it being studied so heavily. You know, everyone's uh, had every minute decision they made analyzed by a hundred different historians so you know there's plenty of what ifs out there what if grushi had come to the battle what if Derlon had gone to the battle of catra a couple of days earlier and forced the anglo-dutch back sooner what if wellington and blucher hadn't kept in contact what if instead of grushi davo had been in command there's literally a million different what ifs and that allows scope for a wargamer to change history which is one of the th the reasons why we play this game surely and I guess the, the biggest what if would be what if the Duke of Wellington had been killed at the Battle of Catrabra, just like he was in our game. So <laughs> just, just had to get that one in. But uh, yeah, so there's plenty of what ifs, there's plenty of scope there for war gamers to change history, to to do those things differently, and see if that would have an effect. I mean, I know people, solo gamers in particular, who will just refight the same battle, but the variables will be. The idea is that they say, what would have happened if Davo had uh, been in command for argument's sake? You might give him a higher strategy rating than Grushi, or 
more individual flair, you know, something like that. So those things you can you can change the variables, and plug them in, and see how that would affect the result. If we expand it out beyond the Battle of Waterloo, we can also look at the whole Hundred Days campaign, and that's another good reason why it's worth wargaming because it is a self-contained campaign that only took place over three months, a little bit longer. But the actual fighting itself only really took place over a week. There's a book by Ian Gale, who was my opponent at The Great Game, and he wrote called Four Days in June. So really, you're looking a couple of weeks tops is the actual campaign itself. So it's very manageable. It's very tightly located. You're not worrying about the invasion of Russia or something like that. And the forces there are reasonably achievable as well. I mean, don't get me wrong, they're big armies, but they are achievable. They're not the Battle of Leipzig big, you know. <laughs> so, so it is achievable to get the armies, or certainly large parts of the armies. You could you could quite easily get the Prussian army at Linny, as an example. I think that would be a complete Napoleonic collection there. If you've got those three core, well, you may as well buy the fourth one as well, haven't you? So it's very easy to get the complete army for the Orbat for the 100 days campaign. And finally, I've saved the best reason for last. The, in my opinion, the best reason that you should wargame the 100 days campaign is the sheer romance of it. You've got a defeated emperor, the man who once ruled the entirety of mainland Europe. His empire spanned from Spain to Moscow, and it took the combined mights of all the crown heads of Europe to finally destroy him. This guy was then exiled to a small Mediterranean island, and then he came back for one last roll of the dice. When I did my video on the old guard, I tried to get as much drama in as possible because it is so intrinsically such a dramatic story. Any last chance gasp, any last roll of the dice, and for him to come up against his his nemesis, Wellington, for the first and only time. It's one of those things that Wargamer dreams are absolutely made of. What would have happened if Julius Caesar had fought Hannibal the Great? What would have happened if Alexander had fought against Charlemagne? You know, these questions are the... When you've had a few beers at the club and you're asking and you want a bit of a discussion, these are the great questions of history. There's a story from the Second Punic War uh, almost certainly not true, where Scipio and Hannibal were talking, and Scipio said to Hannibal, who do you consider to be the three greatest commanders of all time? And Hannibal said, well, I would put myself third, uh, Pyrrhus of Epirus second, and Alexander the Great first. So Scipio had already beaten Hannibal at, at the Battle of Zama. He sort of chuckled at this and said, well, where would you have put yourself if I hadn't beaten you? To which he just deadpan stared back and said, well, first, of course. Now, that's almost certainly not true, but it's a great story. And it's one of those things where, you know, we as wargamers, we as history nerds, we like to say, what would have happened if X fought Y? And in fact, that has been extrapolated out. I saw a hardcore history episode on this where he talks about the historian who came up with it. I can't remember who it was. What would have happened if Alexander the Great, with his Macedonians, had fought Wellington at the Battle of Waterloo. It's a bit out there. I would recommend listening to the Hardcore History episode, but uh, I, I think they rather overestimate the quality of the Macedonian troops, I have to say. But uh, it's it's still possible. So you know, it's those, those great what-if questions, and it's answered. What if the two greatest generals of their time, the Duke of Wellington and Napoleon, saw, you know, met face-to-face -face what would have happened? And we find out at the Battle of Waterloo. So I think that's the main draw for me to 100 Days campaign, is it's iconic, is it's literally iconic. It shines in the night sky of the Napoleonic period like a supernova. It's the brightest object you can see and it always draws the eye. And that can be a massive problem. So I want to say thank you very much for listening so far. It's been a bit rambly this one, but those are my reasons why I think the Battle of Waterloo and the 100 Days campaign are the best reasons to wargame Napoleonic. So not the best reasons to wargame it, but the best sub-era of the Napoleonic Wars to wargame. Leave your reasons in the comments down below. I'm sure there's going to be plenty that I've missed, particularly the ones that refer to the Prussians, because I've not really explored them very much in this video. But uh, yeah, let me know why you guys like the 100 Days campaign, why it's the one that draws you back to it again and again, and 
please make sure you're subscribed so you get the notification bell is turned on and then you'll know when I post the counterpoint to this video why the 100 days campaign is the worst aspect of Napoleonic Wargaming. I have a rather sneaky feeling that that one is going to be a spicy meatball. So thank you very much for watching. I should say before I go as well, I'm starting to do bi-monthly, so well, actually it's bi-monthly, bi-weekly, every two weeks, twice a month, I'm going to be doing live paint-along sessions. We had the last one yesterday. That was me painting some, uh, well, it was a unit that a lot of people were asking what it was. It was 1809 or pre-1812 French Carabineers. So join me for those ones. Those are on Saturday mornings starting at 11 o'clock. Uh, British summer time. We're on at the moment at the end of October. We'll be dropping back an hour to Greenwich Bean time. But uh, I'll, be, I'll be trying to remember to post those as we go along. It may end up becoming a members only stream, but as it stands, I'm going to do it for everyone because yeah, let's get as many people, let's get a little bit of a painting club going on Saturday mornings. Uh, I mean, I know it's difficult. I know kids have got football and things like that, but uh, let's try and get some armies crashed out for the campaign season of 2022 when the world hopefully will be fully reopened again. Thank you very much for watching and I'll catch you guys next time.